Hibernation 144. Grizzlies Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation. Read by David Grizzly Smith. The Defendant by G. K. Chesterton. Read by David Grizzly Smith. A Defense of Patriotism. The decay of patriotism in England during the last year or two is a serious and distressing matter. Only in consequence of such a decay could the current lust of territory be confounded with the ancient love of country. We may imagine that if there were no such thing as a pair of lovers left in the world, all the vocabulary of love might, without rebuke, be transferred to the lowest and most automatic desire. If no type of chivalrous and purifying passion remained, there would be no one left to say that lust bore none of the marks of love, that lust was rapacious and love pitiful, that lust was blind and love vigilant, that lust sated itself and love was insatiable. So it is with the love of the city, that high and ancient intellectual passion which has been written in red blood on the same table with the primal passions of our being. On all sides we hear today of the love of our country, and yet any one who has literally such a love must be bewildered at the talk, like a man hearing all men say that the moon shines by day and the sun by night. The conviction must come to him at last that these men do not realize what the word love means, that they mean by the love of country not what a mystic might mean by the love of God, but something of what a child might mean by the love of jam. To one who loves his fatherland, for instance, our boasted indifference to the ethics of a national war is mere mysterious gibberism. It is like telling a man that a boy has committed murder, but that he need not mind because it is only his son. Here clearly the word love is used unmeaningly. It is the essence of love to be sensitive. It is a part of its doom. And anyone who objects to one must certainly get rid of the other. This sensitiveness, rising sometimes to an almost morbid sensitiveness, was the mark of all great lovers like Dante and all great patriots like Chatham. My country right or wrong— is a thing that no patriot would think of saying except in a desperate case— it is like saying, my mother, drunk or sober. No doubt if a decent man's mother took to drink, he would share her troubles to the last. But to talk as if he would be in a state of gay indifference as to whether his mother took to drink or not is certainly not the language of men who know the great mystery. What we really need for the frustration and overthrow of a deaf and raucous jingoism is a renaissance of the love of the native land. When that comes, all shrill cries will cease suddenly. For the first of all the marks of love is seriousness. Love will not accept sham bulletins or empty victory of words. It will always esteem the most candid counselor the best. Love is drawn to truth by the unerring magnetism of agony. It gives no pleasure to the lover to see ten doctors dancing with vociferous optimism around a deathbed. We have to ask, then, why is it that this recent movement in England, which has honestly appeared to many a renaissance of patriotism, seems to us to have none of the marks of patriotism, at least of patriotism in its highest form? Why has the adoration of our patriots been given wholly to qualities and circumstances good in themselves, but comparatively material and trivial? Trade, 
physical force, a skirmish at a remote frontier, a squabble in a remote continent. Colonies are things to be proud of, but for a country to be only proud of its extremities is like a man being only proud of his legs. Why is there not a high central intellectual patriotism, a patriotism of the head and the heart of the empire, and not merely of its fists and its boots? A rude Athenian sailor may very likely have thought that the glory of Athens lay in rowing with the right kind of oars, or having a good supply of garlic. But Pericles did not think this was the glory of Athens. With us, on the other hand, there is no difference at all between the patriotism preached by Mr. Chamberlain and that preached by Mr. Pat Rafferty, who sings, What do you think of the Irish now? They are both honest, simple-minded, vulgar eulogies upon trivialities and truisms. I have, rightly or wrongly, a notion of the chief cause of this pettiness in English patriotism of today, and I will attempt to expound it. It may be taken generally that a man loves his own stock and environment, and that he will find something to praise in it, but whether it is the most praiseworthy thing or no will depend upon the man's enlightenment as to the facts. If the son of Thackeray, let us say, were brought up in ignorance of his father's fame and genius, it is not improbable that he would be proud of the fact that his father was over six feet high. It seems to me that we, as a nation, are precisely in the position of this hypothetical child of Thackeray's. We fall back upon gross and frivolous things for our patriotism for a simple reason. We are the only people in the world who are not taught in our childhood our own literature and our own history. We are, as a nation, in the truly extraordinary condition of not knowing our own merits. We have played a great and splendid part in the history of universal thought and sentiment. We have been among the foremost in that eternal and bloodless battle in which the blows do not slay, but create. In painting and music, we are inferior to many other nations, but in literature, science, philosophy, and political eloquence, if history be taken as a whole, we can hold our own with any. But all this vast heritage of intellectual glory is kept from our schoolboys like a heresy, and they are left to live and die in the dull and infantile type of patriotism which they learned from a box of tin soldiers. There is no harm in a box of tin soldiers. We do not expect children to be equally delighted with a beautiful box of tin philanthropists. But there is great harm in the fact that the subtler and more civilized honor of England is not presented so as to keep pace with the expanding mind. A French boy is taught the glory of Moliere as well as that of Turin. A German boy is taught his own great national philosophy before he learns the philosophy of antiquity. The result is that, though French patriotism is often crazy and boastful, though German patriotism is often isolated and pedantic, they are neither of them merely dull, common, and brutal, as is so often the strange fate of the nation of Bacon and Locke. It is natural enough, even righteous enough, under the circumstances. An Englishman must love England for something. Consequently, he tends to exalt commerce or prize-fighting, just as a German might tend to exalt music or a Flamand to exalt painting, because he really believes it is the chief merit of his fatherland. It would not be in the least extraordinary if a claim of eating up provinces and pulling down princes were the chief boast of a Zulu. The extraordinary thing is that it is the chief boast of a people who have Shakespeare, Newton, Burke, and Darwin to boast of. The peculiar lack of any generosity or delicacy in the current English nationalism appears to have no other possible origin but in this fact of our unique neglect in education of the study of the national literature. An Englishman could not be silly enough to despise other nations if he once knew how much England had done for them. Great men of letters cannot avoid being humane and universal. 
The absence of the teaching of English literature in our schools is, when we come to think of it, an almost amazing phenomenon. It is even more amazing when we listen to the arguments urged by headmasters and other educational conservatives against the direct teaching of English. It is said, for example, that a vast amount of English grammar and literature is picked up in the course of learning Latin and Greek. This is perfectly true, but the topsy-turviness of the idea never seems to strike them. It is like saying that a baby picks up the art of walking in the course of learning to hop or that a Frenchman may successfully be taught German by helping a Prussian to learn a shanty. Surely the obvious foundation of all education is the language in which that education is conveyed. If a boy has only time to learn one thing, he had better learn that. We have deliberately neglected this great heritage of high national sentiment. We have made our public schools the strongest walls against a whisper of the honor of England. And we have had our punishment in this strange and perverted fact that, while a unifying vision of patriotism can ennoble bands of brutal savages or dingy burghers and be the best thing in their lives, we, who are, the world being judged, humane, honest, and serious individually, have a patriotism that is the worst thing in ours. What have we done, and where have we wandered, we that have produced sages who could have spoken with Socrates, and poets who could walk with Dante, that we should talk as if we have never done anything more intelligent than found colonies and kick niggers? We are the children of light, and it is we that sit in darkness. If we are judged, it will not be for the merely intellectual transgression of failing to appreciate other nations, but for the supreme spiritual transgression of failing to appreciate ourselves. Thank you for listening to The Conclusion of The Defendant by G. K. Chesterton. Read by David Grizzly Smith. Music for this serialized audiobook is Water Droplets on the River by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Theme music for the series is Canon in D by Pacabell, performed by Owen Poteet of owenpoteet.com. Comment or contribute on the website at grizzly.libsyn.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Thank you.